Um, welcome everyone. This is our module three session on generating threat intelligence from an incident. Um, this session uses data from Kill Chain One, which will be made publicly available, um, and demonstrates how we can generate an, an, um, generate intelligence from an incident or intrusion um, and use that data internally. Right, advancing the slides. Um, so we will touch base on our objective. Um, and we're going to iterate, we're going to run through the CTI lifecycle here. Um, we're going to start by um, touching on our stakeholders, requirements, goals, and objectives. Um, then we're going to get into the CTI, the CTI analyst role during an incident and talk a little bit about processing um, intrusion data and information. And um, the bulk of the conversation really is gonna be around um, analysis and production, um, the research and elements to include um, in a CTI report. Um, then we'll touch briefly on dissemination, how we're gonna share this and who we're gonna share this with. And finally, we'll wrap things up with feedback and it, evaluation, a critical step um, in the CTI life cycle and uh, CTI program in general. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll touch base on that here as well. So the objective um, is really um, straightforward. We're gonna demonstrate the important role that CTI plays both during and after an incident. And moving right along into planning and direction, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Stephanie. Great. So we're going to do an overview of the stakeholders in this scenario. Um, so the stakeholders for this kill chain are our CISO, the CTO, the CIO, and executive board. Um, we have people sitting in the SOC, so the defenders, forensics team, instant response, malware analysis, and threat hunting teams. Uh, we have SOC management and the IT team. And this phase of the CTI lifecycle is where our requirements are created. Um, so we can see here in this diagram, some of our goals and objectives. So we wanna identify blind spots in our network, how we're getting attacked. So in our endpoints, network platforms, we wanna understand the adversaries' capabilities. How are they attacking us, why? Uh, what is their method of attacking us? And we want to also call out explicitly any new kind of um, defense mechanisms we want to create because of this CTI lifecycle we're going through. So those might be new detections we write, new threat hunts, um, new purple team test cases. So those might be explicit test cases you run with your purple team to check if a certain blind spot has been uh, covered or not by your defenses. And while performing research isn't necessarily a stakeholder requirement, um, the CTI team should be digging into those IOCs to find new information that they can use to inform the various teams. Um, so we can use different tools and an analytical methods for this kind of research. And back over to Clay. All right. So yeah, so um, touching on collection here. Um, right, so artifacts will be collected from different teams um, that are gonna be involved during the course of an incident. Um, this will be the, our, our IR team, our forensics team, um, and even our malware analysis team. Um, who might get some artifacts from the forensics team. Um, so all, all of these teams work together. And there might be, you know, some people might be on multiple teams. Um, so every organization, this will, this will look different. Um, additional data um, and information will come from external sources through OSINT on existing data. So OSINT includes um, 
sources documented in our collections management framework or collection management framework that, that we've created. Um, but we'll also include sources that are discovered through the process of pivoting, which we'll touch on in a little bit. Um, yeah, and pivoting on existing data plays a critical role during OSINT. Um, when we're pivoting, when we're using open source intelligence, um, we might not know what data source we're gonna run across that might be useful. Um, for example, it could be as it could be um, an article or a um, an in depth malware analysis report that we find useful. Um, so during OSINT, um, yes, we will rely on our platforms that we're aware of and that we've documented in the CMF. But at the same time, we're also going to be um, uh, uh, performing research that's going to lead us to new data data sources um, that will pull those in as well. So just wanted to note on all of that. Processing. So this is the next phase in the CTF life cycle, and we'll be using intrusion data and information uh, for this. Now, every organization will be different, and um, depending on the level of maturity the organization has, this could be very limited or quite verbose. Um, tips are commonly used. So the tip is a threat intelligence platform. Um, for processing and OpenCTI is a free and open source platform. And here's um, just a quote pulled from, from um, their website. And yeah, it's a great way just to, to structure, store, organize, um, and visualize technical and non-technical information about threats. Um, automation of data from a tip to a SIM is another commonly implemented process. Um, and as we're Working through these um, 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 events or intrusions, the daily work we do, look for opportunities to develop this phase um, of the CTI lifecycle. And ideas will come at random times. You never know when an idea is going to strike um, or present themselves. Um, but make note, document those, and um, you know that way it'll you'll you'll make improvements um, along the way. So now we'll uh, get into analysis and production. And for that, I'll uh, kick it over to Lucid. All righty. So uh, analysis happens uh, during, an in support in, during an incident, and this can be to support other teams. And it, it produces CTI that will actually be in uh, reporting. And the CTI team can really add value by analyzing OSINT um, by pivoting through IOCs. Uh, like was was already mentioned, uh, you know, an open source intelligence can be visualized uh, and uh, analyzed a lot of different tools, platforms, and models. And uh, I'll have a demo here of a couple of those tools, uh, Virus Total and AnyRun, uh, which provide uh, sandboxing and uh, visualization of uh, IOCs. All right, I just want to highlight a couple of open source intelligence tools that we can use. Uh, maybe if we have an active incident and uh, we've been provided some IOCs, we can uh, see what's publicly available about those, those IOCs and see if we can discover infrastructure or tactics uh, or other things that could help us to um, uh, help the other teams in incident response, threat hunting to respond um, to an incident. So in this case, uh, the situation is that the uh, incident response team has provided us with a, a domain. Uh, a user has clicked an attachment in an email and it really wasn't what they were expecting. And um, they reported it and uh, firewall log showed at this domain, uh, baseballcharlemagnelagardeur.com uh, was contacted. So uh, we do a little bit of um, Googling first. Okay, this looks like might be a real, uh, maybe French baseball team. Uh, so maybe this site isn't um, 
infrastructure that was set up by a threat actor could have maybe been compromised if this is uh, really a malicious site. It's suspicious at this point. Uh, we can see an alien vault, which is another provider of open source intelligence, um, shows that this is probably a WordPress page. It's got this WP content in the uh, links that we see here, the associated URLs. So maybe it's a uh, compromised um, WordPress site. We'll see. Maybe we'll see nothing um, when we look at Virus Total. Now, Virus Total sandboxes URLs and files uh, that people upload and then uh, comes up with a report essentially um, of all of the behavior uh, from those executions. So if we look here, we can see that the, the domain itself is actually considered malicious uh, by some security vendors, uh, six out of the 94. Um, as we go through the tabs, there's some more information about the domain, uh, some relations. This is really the bread and butter here. Uh, virus total, where it shows uh, some of the behavior uh, and and other relationships uh, between this domain and other files, um, other files that contain this domain in their in the, in the in the file itself, uh, files that when run communicated with this domain. But really, uh, the best. Uh, the best visualization of all of this information is to use the virus total graph. Now you can create this graph uh, after uh, setting up a free account. And um, we can look right away and see, okay, something must be wrong. There are in fact uh, document files that communicate doc and uh, XLS, uh, Excel uh, spreadsheets that communicate with this suspicious domain. Now we already have more information than when we started with. But we can start to look over the uh, the graph, and uh, we can see that these documents are considered malicious by uh, security vendors, by different antivirus in, um, uh, engines. And um, we can really start to pivot from here. Uh, we could find a document that's considered malicious and see what its other relationships are and expand those out. These aren't expanded right now. So for instance, if we expand domains, we will see that um, there's some other domains that get contacted when this document's opened. Some of them are related to Microsoft, so those might aren't really suspicious. Um, but there's other ones like this domain, Tango with Colette. Uh, and we can really just continue to expand because um, if there's there may be other documents that also communicate uh, with with this uh, with this domain, Tango with Colette. So we're going to find some additional documents. So this might give us, uh, you know, Tango with Colette. That's a pivot to infrastructure. Uh, from And we pivoted from that infrastructure potentially to more um, tactics, uh, to uh, abilities uh, that, that the actor has um, based on, you know, the, uh, the results when these are executed in the sandbox. Uh, this is already a lot of information uh, that we could pass back to the other teams. We can really keep going. Uh, we can look around at the graph and see that um, there is also this PowerShell script. Uh, it's not quite obvious from looking at it that it is other than the file name uh, that it's PowerShell script, but we could see that it is executed by several of these files that communicate with the domain, the suspicious domain that we've been given. So maybe our teams are gonna start looking for PowerShell scripts in their, in their, uh, in their tools, their on-premise tools. And another thing we can do is that we can take a document that uh, is, has relations um, to this, what looks like a campaign and we can run it through any run. Now, any run is also a sandbox, but it will show, it will play back. Uh, it, well, it's interactive, first of all. When you run the file, you're able to interact with it in a, in a virtual machine, in a sandbox. But then after the fact, it creates a report and a link back to that session that shows what happened in real time. So in this case, we can really just look back through all the public tasks to see if a file of that hash was run through uh, any run. 
Now we can see there's a bunch of different runs. This is a historic uh, campaign uh, from a, uh, a threat actor, uh, Lazarus Group. And uh, we can see that um, some of these may be more or less complete as far as whether it act, the files actually reached out and downloaded a malicious uh, payload. Just And that there could be all kinds of reasons for that. But uh, this one here um, is probably the most complete run. And we can see on the right here the exact timings of um, the fact that WinWord ran, uh, Windows uh, Microsoft Word ran and that uh, an exploit of some sort caused this PowerShell to execute. And we can see more information about this PowerShell itself and all the different events that happened as a result. We can get a PCAP that's actually a capture of all the network traffic uh, that was generated from this session. Uh, we can see all the connections here and look through them and see if there's any other uh, domains maybe that we um, that, that we missed. When there's actually this towing operations, uh, there's another domain here that we actually didn't miss. I don't know that we necessarily saw that on our graph over here. So as you take bits and pieces that you get from one tool, you can put them into another. Uh, and you can find out more information that you can pass back as a uh, list of IOCs. Uh, that could be very useful uh, to uh, threat hunting and uh, everybody else that's responding to uh, an incident. That is my demo of Virus Total and any run. Uh, so this graphic focuses on uh, the production uh, element of the phase. And uh, this can be a template. It's just, it shows some of the things that go on a report. It's not, doesn't limit you to just these items. Um, you know, the graphic section doesn't just show all, it's not, it doesn't, you're not limited to these graphics, uh, but you could put things on there like a multi go graph uh, or uh, just a diamond model. Uh, but this is a good visualization of all the things that would go on the report. Um, and uh, you're thinking about, well, with a complete report, does it tell, uh, or if you're thinking about whether to put something on the report as you're completing it, you're trying to ask the question, does it help to tell the story? So uh, one of the things from the previous slide, the diamond model for intrusion analysis, um, this could be used to both track, uh, can track both failed or successful intrusions. Uh, and uh, it models the relationship between data points. Um, and it helps with pivoting, testing theories about how things are connected or how an intrusion happened. Um, so in this example, uh, the antivirus on an endpoint within the organization uh, detects a scheduled task that might be suspicious. Uh, that information is passed to a threat hunting team that uh, discovers a maldoc, a malicious document. Uh, that communicates with infrastructure, which we see on the left uh, of the diagram, uh, we're able to resolve that IP to a domain name. And that domain name, we don't know who the adversary is, we're just going to use it to define our adversary. So because we had malware love that XYZ, we're just going to call this cluster of activity uh, uh, part of malware love. And uh, we can do this, use this model to, to uh, perform analysis periodically, uh, whatever schedule makes sense for the organization. Uh, the other way to show the data um, uh, in an intrusion is an intrusion summary. Uh, this is just a listing of all the different uh, data points from the previous uh, graph, same information. And um, intrusion summaries from inside an organization are really the best source of intelligence to show what's actually going on with that company uh, with you know, thousands of attacks going on outside of the organization day to, uh, even in a single day. And the diamond model can help to visualize the data points from these summaries. And then you can start to see clusters of activity emerge from this process of going from a, a summary to a, a way of modeling or visualizing the data uh, to starting to see patterns. Uh, the MITRE ATT&CK Navigator, this is a web-based tool. Um, it's free uh, for uh, annotating and exploring these matrices. Um, 
You can visualize your defensive coverage. You can plan for red or blue team activities, purple team. Um, and um, this is this this visual is a heat map of TTPs that were part of Kill Chain One. Uh, this is an example. We there's not every not everything that happened in Kill Chain One is on here. Uh, not all of the little sub methods are on here. Um, so you'll be able to uh, with a re there is a link at the end of the presentation um, where you can just search for this uh, TAC layer navigator and fill this out yourself. I will turn it over now uh, back to Clay. All right, excellent, thank you. So here is an example of a Maltigo graph. Uh, Maltigo is a link analysis tool um, that we can use to pivot um, and to, to find additional uh, data points, um, information, and, and context. Um, this example demonstrates how we pivot from an IP address to a file hash. So the file hash that I'm referring to here is the one that is tagged as sandstone malware just made that up um, the malware has been attributed to a threat group we see stardust um, kalima reference there but it's also associated with another ip address which um, has another uh, website uh, or url associated with it so all additional context um, so now what? Um, well, the IP used in our intrusion can be associated to other pieces of malware, so we can see that. Um, so this should be investigated for additional evidence. Um, the malware we pivot to, um, or pivoted to in this example, was not found in our environment. Um, so it is possible that another adversary is using the same infrastructure Right. So further evidence um, is required um, in order to be able to identify that um, or uh, apply some sort of uh, level of confidence as well. Um, so I actually added um, addition, an, another piece of malware to demonstrate that there are two pieces of malware um, in this scenario now. So it, there, there can be different scenarios that come about, but just wanted to um, highlight this other possibility where another piece of malware was identified um, using that IP address or that IP address was serving up multiple different pieces of malware there. And another one was identified and it is attributed to a different threat actor. Um, in this example, um, it's noted that the limestone malware is, has been attributed to hidden Cobra. So for our example and demonstration purposes for Kill Chain 1, um, two different threat groups using two different pieces, so two pieces of malware have been associated with that, with that IP address. And each piece of malware is associated with a different threat group. Now, one thing that is interesting is that Hidden Cobra and Stardust Kalima are, are attributed to North Korea. So we could say with high confidence that our intrusion is associated with North Korea. Now, for Magnus Tempus, um, attribution is not one of our threat um, in intelligence requirements. Maybe it is for your organization. Um, I would argue for most organizations that attribution shouldn't matter. What matters is the intrusion, right? Who cares who did it? Um, how will, how would um, <laughs> knowing the adversary change anything you do? Would it? I would argue that it wouldn't. Um, perhaps another discussion for another time, but um, since attribution is not in our, what, one of our threat intelligence requirements, it's an interesting observation that we can make and an interesting observation that we can include, um, or an interesting assessment maybe that we can include in our um, CTI report. Um, yeah, it could be useful uh, for other things as well, but 
um, yeah, just wanted to really demonstrate that Maltigo can be used for, for pivoting, finding additional information, and providing more context around an intrusion. And with that, I'll kick it over to Stephanie. Great. So these last two sections will be about dissemination of the information and the feedback and evaluation. Um, so dissemination here in this kill chain specifically, since all of our teams were involved in the incident, um, they're already aware of the outcomes. And aside from the report being generated and being delivered to our stakeholders, we don't have anyone else that we have to update about the incident, right? So there's no other dissemination required. Um, in another scenario, if there was a team that wasn't involved and was not a stakeholder, um, you might want to think about how to distribute the information to them and what they need to know about the incident. Um, so next we'll talk about, uh, here are just an overview again of the stakeholders um, in this specific incident. So we had, or this specific kill chain, uh, we had the executives, management, IT team, and then members of our SOC on the right. So next we'll talk about feedback and evaluation and a method for evaluating your CTI lifecycle. So here, um, during the planning and direction phase, you wanna make sure you have defined, documented, and socialized processes for feedback. You don't want to be, uh, you want everyone to know how to provide feedback and you want a clearly defined process for this. You, know, you want it to be documented so everyone is aware. Um, and you want really ongoing feedback. You want it to be readily available for people to give feedback to you. And once you receive this feedback, you want to evaluate uh, your processes. So you want them to be complete, accurate, relevant, and timely. Um, so we'll talk about these in a little bit more depth. So you want to complete, you want your CTI information intelligence provided to be complete. So does it have enough information to generate a proper response? So how comprehensive is the intelligence? Are all of the data attributes present? Is there vulnerability analysis? Um, does it correlate across an entire organization? and doesn't look at like non-cyber intelligence and other events for like a complete threat profile. So this comes back to like your intelligence requirements at the very beginning. Uh, were you able to capture all of these and did you deliver? Um, the next part is, was it accurate? So were there errors in your generated intelligence? You know, what data sources did you use? Were they accurate? Um, was this the most up-to-date information or were there information changes along the way? And is it time bound? Is there like an expiration for this intelligence? Uh, sometimes if you, if you provide information about specific IOCs, those might change very quickly. Um, so it's important to note if it's time bound and how long this will be accurate for. Okay, so now we'll talk about, is it relevant and is it timely? Um, so your intelligence has to address the relevant threats inside your organization and be delivered in a way that allows for effective action, right? So does it map back to your original intelligence requirements? How do the stakeholders submit requirements and provide feedback for more relevant intelligence? And is it timely? It has to be produced and delivered quickly um, so it can be used fast enough to make a difference. So how is it delivered to ensure quick consumption? Is it delivered by email, et cetera? Uh, how long between the discovery of a threat and notifying the stakeholders? And is this, is this intelligence released to the stakeholders as you go along and you learn more, or is it at the very end? So that's it for um, feedback and evaluation, and I'll pass it back to Clay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, yep, so here's some resources that were um, touched upon in the presentation. 
thank you. Thanks for watching. Um, we uh, join the conversation on Discord here. Um, this is our Discord. There's also the DEF CON Discord that, that folks should be in. Um, we'll be monitoring uh, those channels as well. So please engage there. And wanted to call out that we, we, we did create a module one session and that was released prior to DEF CON. So um, if you're unsure about any of the content in this, um, in this module three, be sure to refer back to that, that module one session um, that is available and up on YouTube. So thanks again, everyone, and look forward to um, um, engaging in the conversation and um, see you in, in future modules. Thank you.